Jesus, be glorified. Your ways are higher than mine. Washed away every stain, Lord. No greater love than the blood, Lord. Jesus. 
morning. Let's stand and worship the Lord together today.
Good morning. Welcome to worship at Canyons Church. I want to begin with a very special congratulations to Mary Grace and her Envelopes there if you'd like to give. To well, and we'll make sure it goes to the right place. Um, along with that, we just want to encourage you also and remind you of ways that you can give online at canyonschurch.com or using the uh, tithing box on your way out. And if you're a guest with us, uh, Christians, we give um, often our money and our time and our resources as gifts to God. Because of all that he's done for us, we give trusting him to provide. And if you're a gift, um, I don't want you to give a gift today. Because Canyons Church would like to show you a free gift instead. And if you listen, Pastor Jason, at the end of his sermon... He's going to reveal what the free gift that can be offered to you today. So listen closely and pay attention to that. Let's join together in prayer as we continue in worship. Father, thank you for all that you have done for us. You have sacrificed your son for us. You have shown your love for us a never-ending love, an everlasting love. And we thank you. We don't deserve it, but you give it to us anyways. Father, as we focus on your love today, I pray that you would be glorified and honored with our praise and with our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Please, please stay sitting for a video. It happened. The unthinkable the shift that showed our frailty. Nonetheless, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. 
We are separated. We are isolated. And in this world, we have trouble. Nonetheless, we take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. We are conflicted and frustrated, weary too. But nonetheless, those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. We are down but not out, sidelined but still in the game. We fight for our families, we hold on to love, we strive for kindness, but the hard times get harder. Nonetheless, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. We walk through adversity. We are sons and daughters of the Most High. We know to whom we belong and we know where our hope lies. For he is the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, the one who is and the one who is to come. Bleak, they say there's a lot to fear, but nonetheless, we are strong. We are courageous. We are the church. Amen. Would you stand and sing and ask God to revive his people and to revive our nation?
come awake in the city. Oh God, a revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble in the chains hit the ground. Oh God, a revival, pour it out, pour it out.
to tell you a story. It's a story about people who do some of the hardest, most important work on earth. They start churches in places where people tell them, we don't need church. They provide food and shelter for families who don't even have the basics of life. They share the gospel everywhere for everyone. They are North American missionaries. It's always been hard doing what they do, but it's not always been like this past year. When the world shut down, the easy thing for them would have been to wait, hold off, or to stop. But that didn't happen. And it calls for your North American missionaries, the mission always moves forward. We're still sharing the gospel. We're still impacting lives. We're still here. We never stopped. Right now, your North American missionaries are adapting. They're innovating. They're coming up with new ways to take the gospel into places it's never been before. You can do that when you have tens of thousands of people like you who give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Ministry costs money, and so your giving enables us to continue to spread the good news of the gospel. You see, no matter what's happening around us, when the world says stop, God always says go. That's why we're seeing new churches planted, we're seeing needs met, and we're seeing believers baptized. It's what happens when God's people give, pray, and go. Thank you for praying for your missionaries because prayer is powerful. And thank you for giving to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. As you do that, you provide the fuel that moves the mission forward. There's so much work to be done. Now, more than ever, it's estimated that there are 275 million lost people in North America. And so, what happens next in this story is up to you. So good to see you today. Let me go ahead and say before I forget it, kids that would like to go to kids' church, third grade and under, head on back now and the volunteers will meet you in the end. Uh, let me just say one other thing. Uh, Mary Grace and Noah are newlyweds and so that's why we were acknowledging them and so we welcome them here. I have joked Mary Grace and Noah, it's a very biblical marriage because Noah found grace. Isn't that awesome? We're so thankful also for Justin, Pastor Justin. Um, over and over again, I keep finding ways that I'm so glad he's here and don't know how we survived without him because I noticed that already all the clocks are put in their right place and um, usually I have to get somebody because I just can't reach them. And so it's done and we're, we're ahead of schedule here today. Turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter number 40. Genesis 40. We're going to look at pieces of chapters 40, 41, and 42 this morning. And what an awesome testimony we heard last week from Brooke, and she's over sharing uh, with the Hispanic ministry today um, about God's work in Uganda, and we've been praying all week for North American missions. And we do all of this because the Great Commission is not just for a few, it is for us all. Jesus is Lord. And as such, he has commanded us as his church to make disciples of all the nations. And so to this end, it's not the great suggestion. It is the great commission. George Stott, a one-legged teacher, volunteered for missionary service in China. And he was often asked by others, why would you go to China if you only have one leg? Listen to what he said. 
I do not see those with two legs going, so I must. And thus began 20 years of missions work by George Stott in China. He got it. He understood that it was his king who had called him to go. Consider James Calvert. James Calvert went out as a missionary to the cannibals on the Fiji Islands. And the ship captain tried to get him to turn around and to go back. And he said, you will lose your life and all of those with you if you go amongst those savages. And to that, Calvert replied, listen, we died before we came here. Did you hear that? What he is saying is that, listen, Jesus is my Lord. My life is in his hands. I have surrendered my life to him. And sadly, we often compartmentalize our life and we don't give the Lord access to all the rooms. You know what I mean? Lord Jesus, I'll give you this room and I'll give you that room and I'll give you that room. But there are some rooms in the back that I am going to hold on for myself. And, and I can't help but remember what my uh, spiritual mentor, Dr. Stephen Olford, often said. He is either Lord of all, or he is not Lord at all. This morning, you've already heard me talking a lot about lordship and about kingship. And as we turn our attention to Genesis 40... I want you to remember, again, that Joseph was in that dark pit. He was in that dark prison. And that's where we closed out last week. We talked about how he had interpreted the dreams of two fellow prisoners. And he had told the chief cupbearer, which in your Bible also may be, may be translated the chief butler. He told him in Genesis 40, 14. But when all goes well for you, remember that I was with you. Please show kindness to me by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. He was unfairly placed in that dungeon. And then verse 23, same chapter says, Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. And you know, the chief cupbearer may have forgotten Joseph, but I want to tell you something. His Lord had not forgotten him. And others may forget you too. And they may treat you unfairly and they may even reject you. You may look at this world and you may say, where is justice in this world? But your Lord has not forgotten you. When we are in those pits, when we're in those dark places, we have to remember that he has not forgotten us. In fact, if we look closely here, you know what we find? We find that not only had God not forgotten Joseph, but God had been preparing Joseph for this very moment. And I hope you hear this. You see, it's hard to see the glory ahead when you're in a dark pit. It's hard to see the blue skies and the green grass when you're going through a storm. But in those moments, God is at work. And so how do we go through those times? By fixing our eyes on Jesus Christ. And that how we are able to look beyond the cross to the joy. In that pit, God was preparing Joseph. And God works on us in our pits too. Now, look at Genesis 41, 1 through 4. At the end of two years, Pharaoh had a dream. He saw seven healthy-looking, clearly well-fed cows that came up from the Nile and began to graze among the reeds. And then it says that seven other cows, sickly and thin, came up from the Nile and stood beside the healthy cows on the bank of the Nile. Now, don't you listen to this. The sickly, thin cows were apparently craving a hamburger. You know those commercials on TV with the sign, the cows eat more chicken? These cows have signs that say, eat more cows. Because it says that these sickly, thin cows ate the healthy, well-fed cows. And then Pharaoh woke up. Shortly thereafter, he fell asleep again. And, and the story continues with a second dream. And in Genesis 41, 5-7, through 7, 
Pharaoh saw the heads of grain, plump and good, that came up on the stalk. And then there were seven heads of grain, thin and scorched by the east wind, that sprouted up. And the thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven full ones. And then Pharaoh woke up again, kind of like church members around 12. And when morning came, Pharaoh was troubled. And so he called together all the magicians and all the wise men in the land. In verse 8 of chapter 41, it tells us, But no one could interpret them, the dreams, for him. And then all of a sudden, that chief cupbearer who had forgotten Joseph suddenly remembers, oh, what's his name? That's down in the pit that interpreted my dream. And it says in verse 14 that they quickly brought him up out of the dungeon. And for someone who had been in that place, he obviously needed a little bit of a makeover. So what happens? He shaved, he changed clothes, and he went to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph in verse 15, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. And Joseph then in verse 16, he moves the focus from himself to God. We talked about that this morning at our prayer time here with the worship team, about turning our praise back to God. And and right here, this is exactly what's happening. He's saying, I, Joseph, am not able to interpret the dream. It is God who will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. If it's going to happen, it's not going to be because of man. It's not going to be because of Joseph. It's not going to be because of the magicians or the wise men. It is going to be because God did it, that he is able. And so in verses 17 through 24... Pharaoh begins to recount his dreams to Joseph. And we fast forward, we see Joseph interpreting the dreams for him. And so he, he tells Pharaoh that the seven good cows and the, the seven good heads of grain represent seven good years. On the other hand, the seven thin, sickly cows and The seven worthless scorched heads of grain represent bad years of famine. And Joseph elaborated, seven years of abundance will plan, but it will be followed by seven years of famine that the years of abundance will be forgotten. And of course, Pharaoh, if we were him, we would have the same question. He asked, what should I do? Genesis 41, 33 through 36 provides the answer. Joseph told Pharaoh to look for a discerning and wise man and to set him over the land of Egypt. Let him appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the harvest during those seven good years and let them gather all the excess food during the seven good years. And then under Pharaoh's authority, they would store the grain in the cities so they may preserve it as food. And so Pharaoh asked this in verse 38. Look at it. Can we find anyone like this? A man who has God's spirit in him? And then suddenly there is a light bulb. There's a light bulb moment. And Pharaoh says in verses 39 through 40, Since God has made all of this known to you, Joseph, there is no one as discerning and wise as you are. So you, Joseph, will be over my house, and all my people will obey your commands. And listen to this. Only I, as king, will be greater than you. And so the Lord raised up Joseph from the pit and set him at the right hand of the throne of Pharaoh. Joseph is placed over all the land of Egypt, and he is given all the best. The king even gives him the second best chariot to ride in. In in our context today, he he didn't have Air Force One or Air Force Two. He had something different. He had ground force two. And Pharaoh gave Joseph the name that was above all names in Egypt, that at Zaphonath Pania, every knee would bow. And he was given a Gentile bride, 
I looked up her name. How do you pronounce it? And the guy kept saying, as enough, as enough, as enough. And I listened with my southern ears, and it sounded like, that's enough, that's enough, that's enough. That's what my wife tells me when I'm sitting down to eat dinner. That's enough, that's enough. And you know what happens? He's given that Gentile wife, as enough. And do you know who her daddy was? Potiphar. Do you guys remember? Do you remember? What an interesting twist. Can you imagine his relationship with the in-laws? I mean, Megan and Harry haven't seen anything. Some of you will get that later. And Joseph, at 30 years old, he went throughout all of Egypt and God had prepared him. And what is happening here? Man kept pushing Joseph down, down in the pit, taken down to Egypt, down in the prison. And God kept raising him up. And don't miss this. The text is not about Joseph being so awesome and being so heroic. No, the text is about God carrying out his plan through Joseph, even as Joseph has to patiently wait. And sometimes we struggle with the waiting. Sometimes we struggle with the trusting. Sometimes we become overconfident in ourselves and we need humility. Other times we lack confidence because we're looking to ourselves and to stuff instead of to Christ. And oh, that we might remember that our story, just like Joseph, is not about us either but about how great God is and about how He is carrying out His plan in us and through us. And when you know that, you know that He is greater than any perceived shortcoming we may have. He is able. And so through this man, Joseph, God would save His people from famine and from suffering. God raised Joseph up from that pit to save people. We might ask, what should we do while we wait and we trust? I don't want to park here too long, but let me just give you some bullet points really fast. What do we do? Like Joseph, here's some action points. Continue to live faithfully. Continue to live faithfully, even while you're waiting, even while maybe you're doubting, even while you're in the storm. Continue to live faithfully. Joseph did, even in those dark places. Courageously hold firm to biblical truths and convictions. In other words, you may not see the green grass. You may not see the blue skies when you're going through the storm. But you know the word of God is true. Hold to it. And then, trust God with your future. Trust God with your future. You know, whatever we're going through is temporary in light of eternity. And we can trust God who numbers our days. And then, yield to the transforming work of God's spirit so that others may see Christ in us. Over 2,000 years ago, at another place and at another time, Jesus, you see this just like Jesus? We're looking at Joseph and we see him foreshadowing Jesus. At, at another time, at another place, Jesus had been rejected. He had been falsely accused. He had been wrongly imprisoned. And as the innocent one, he was condemned to death to die on the cruel cross. And then after his death, Jesus was placed in a dark, hopeless tomb. But the story doesn't end there, because as you know, on the third day, the earth began to shake, and the stone was rolled away to reveal to us that the tomb was empty. And for 40 days, Jesus lived and walked on the face of the earth, seen by hundreds of people, after his resurrection, and then Jesus ascended to the Father. And so we might ask this question. If Jesus ascended to the Father, where is Jesus today? Well, we could answer that a couple of ways. In one sense, he's where? He's in us. And as God, he is ever-present. And so we understand that Christ lives in us. He empowers us. But in another sense, the Bible also teaches us that not only is Christ in us, but the resurrected Jesus is also seated at the right hand of the throne of God. 
His work is done. That's why he's seated. He doesn't die over and over again. He died one time as a sacrifice for sin. And he is seated. And as the king, he is victorious. And that victorious king who is at the right hand of God, we know that he is coming again. And guess what? We see Joseph here. And where's he at? He's right beside the throne of Pharaoh, second in charge. And there's a couple of correlations that stand out. I'm going to point those out to you, and then we'll go eat chicken, okay? Here we go. Number one, notice Joseph as God's only means of salvation. Verses 47 through 49 says, During the seven years of abundance, the land produced outstanding harvests. Joseph gathered all the excess food in the land of Egypt during the seven years and put it in the cities. He put food in every city from the fields around it. So Joseph stored up grain in such abundance like the sand of the sea, and he stopped measuring it because it was beyond measure. And then, not only that, but we find out that before the famine came, Joseph had two sons. The first son's name was Manasseh, which meant God has made me forget all my hardship. Isn't that good? Ephraim was his second son. And Ephraim means that God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. So Manasseh and Ephraim are the two sons before the famine. And then the famine came and just as it happened just as God had made it known through Joseph. And so verse 54 says, Just as Joseph had said, and there was a famine all across Egypt, the people cried out to Pharaoh for food. And he told all of Egypt, listen carefully, go to Joseph and do whatever he tells you. And then the famine spreads and it extends beyond Egypt. And it's not just a local issue. It spreads across the whole region. 57 says that every land came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain. For the, the famine was severe in every land. And then the scene shifts from Egypt to the land of Canaan. Genesis 42 begins by saying, Jacob, Joseph's father, learned that there was grain in Egypt. And he said, why are we sitting around here looking at each other? That's my translation. Why are we sitting around here looking at each other when our pantries are bare, when the grocery stores have nothing on the shelves, and we know that they just built that brand new Harmons up in Idaho? Let's go. Let's go to Idaho. Let's go get us some potatoes, right? And so it makes complete sense to me. But I want to point out to you that Joseph alone was providing all of this. He not only foretold it, he made the provisions. And listen, if, you could, if, 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 uh, if Jacob could have sent a text message or if he could have FaceTimed Pharaoh to say, what can we do? Pharaoh would say, talk to Joseph. Because salvation came through Joseph to the people, not just in Egypt, but throughout the land. But salvation only came to those who came to him. Now notice the second thing then. Notice that the nations, all these people from all these lands, they come and they bow before Joseph. And so Genesis 42, 2-4 says, here's Jacob. Go down there and buy some grain for us so that we will live and not die. Sounds like a good plan to me. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he thought something might happen to him. And here's a question for us this morning. Why on earth is Benjamin singled out here? You might say, well, Benjamin is the youngest. Jacob wants to protect him, and, and that's certainly true. But can I suggest that there's a lot more to it than that? If we take a moment and, and flash back and go back into, into Genesis, you may remember that after obtaining Esau's birthright through questionable means, you remember that? Jacob fled from the presence of Esau because he 
feared him, and he found refuge in Padan Aram with his uncle Laban. And once Joseph arrived there, he spotted a beautiful young woman. Her name was Rachel, and she was the daughter of Laban. Now, if you're following, Laban is his uncle, and so that would make Rachel his what? First, first cousin. But don't worry. I had a University of Alabama graduate tell me that from his experience, this is quite normal. Is anybody from Alabama here this morning? Let me just ask real fast. See, no hands. So that means in Genesis 29, 9 through 12, do I have your attention? We have the first instance in Scripture of kissing cousins. And so while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, and she was a shepherdess. And as soon as Jacob saw his uncle Laban's daughter, Rachel, with his sheep, he went up and rolled the stone away from the opening and watered his uncle Laban's sheep. It's kind of like flexing your muscles. I was on that road trip with uh, Rebecca doing gymnastics in southern Utah, and there were teenagers in the pool area. There were two guys and two girls, and it was pitiful. I watched the whole thing and thought, I'm glad I'm not a teenager anymore. Literally, the boy gets up out of the pool and walks across the room like this. (laughs) Bless his heart is what we would say in Georgia. Bless his heart. Joseph flexes his muscles, if you will, in their culturally appropriate way. And talk about a memorable first kiss. Watch what happens to Rachel. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept loudly. Jacob kissed Rachel and wept loudly. How would you like to have that happen? You see, I don't think you'd expect a callback, right? I mean, it's like, this is it. Don't hold your breath that there's going to be a callback unless it was the breath that did it in the first place. So what's going on here? Well, Rachel runs to tell Jacob what has happened, and Jacob runs back and punches him in the nose. Is that what happens? No. Jacob, Jacob's out there, and the father-in-law Laban comes out and gives him a hug and kisses him and welcomes him back. And in this moment, what is going on? Jacob is weeping loudly. Because he is overcome with emotion. He has completed this long journey. He is now with his family. He sees this beautiful young lady. And and Laban is welcoming him. And also knows he's got a good workman on his hands. And soon he puts him to work. Jacob worked hard for Laban. And so he offered to pay Jacob for his labor. And this is what Jacob said. I'll work for you seven years for your younger daughter Rachel. And at first blush, we may think, he is a terrible negotiator. Why did he begin with seven years? Why not start with one and kind of let's work our way to the middle? But but I'm reminded that he's not in a hurry to get back to Esau. Remember, he is fearful of Esau. And Rachel is probably pretty young at this point. And so Jacob worked seven years for Rachel. And then Laban sent his daughter to be married to Jacob But once the marriage is consummated, Jacob awakens to find that he is instead married to Leah. The Bible says that she had weak eyes. Basically, in a nice way, it's saying she wasn't nearly as pretty as Rachel, in contrast, who was beautiful in every way. On the Andy Griffith show, if they asked Andy and Barney if she was pretty, they'd say, She's so nice. She's so nice. And Jacob was ticked off, but what could he do? He loved Rachel. And so he worked seven more years to take Rachel as his wife. But he loved Rachel more than Leah. But Leah began to have children. And if you look on the screen, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. If you look at the screen, you'll see the the birth order. These are all of Leah's children, and these are the four sons who are born in this order. And so it begins with Reuben. But you know what's so sad? Is the name Reuben means, surely he will love me now. 
Simeon is the second one. And it means, the Lord has heard that I am unloved. Levi, at last my husband will become attached to me. Judah, now I will praise the Lord. And so, at this point, though, do you notice anything missing? You don't see Rachel's name at all. And so Rachel tried to take matters into her own hands. She, she did cry out to God, but then she acted and she sent her servant, her slave, Bilhah, to Jacob as his wife. And so you see there, Bilhah gave birth to Dan, which means God has vindicated me. And then Bilhah gave birth to Naphtali, which means I have wrestled with my sister and won. And so at this point in time, you see four sons from Leah, two from the servant, the slave of Rachel. But Leah has not been having children now. And so what does she do? She takes matter into her own hands. She sends her servant, her slave, Zilpah, and sends her to Jacob as a wife. And you'll notice the next one, Bilhah gives birth to Dan, or to, is that the? I am happy that women call me happy. But this amazing thing happens. Leah has sent Zilpah in, and now Leah starts having babies again. And so Leah gives birth to Issachar. Issachar, not Issachar, Issachar. Issachar, I listened to that one too, Issachar. And I kept hearing, it's a car, it's a car, it's a car. Meaning God has... Rewarded, Leah also gave birth to Zebulun. This time, my husband will honor me. And then God remembered Rachel. After all of that, and down at the very end, Rachel gives birth to Joseph, saying, The Lord has taken away my disgrace. And then she gives birth to Benjamin. She wanted one more son, and she got her desire, but if you remember, she died as a result of childbirth bearing Benjamin. So you say, Pastor Jason, why are we going through all this? You know, it's about time. Here's the reason. These are the 12 sons of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob. And when we look at this list, it stands out that only two sons were born to Rachel. And their names are Joseph, who, if we look into our present context, is now in Egypt, and Benjamin who the father is wanting to hold back and not let him go. And for the sake of time, we're skipping lots of details. But when the time came for Jacob to escape from his father-in-law Laban, and he went and he was about to meet Esau face to face, remember he's fearful. What is Esau going to do to me for revenge? And watch this little nugget. Genesis 33, 1. Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming toward him with 400 men. So he divided his children among Leah, Rachel, and the two slave women. And then he puts the slaves and their children first, Leah and her children next, and who's last? Rachel and Joseph. Benjamin hasn't been born yet. You see what Jacob's doing? Those who are in the very back are in the safest position. And right there in the back, we see Rachel and Joseph. Joseph loved Rachel deeply. He loved her the most. Joseph. Jacob loved Joseph because he loved Rachel so much. Now the good news is Jacob and Esau are restored and nothing happens here. But don't you know that this was the starting point of jealousy for those other brothers who were put up in the front? And Joseph's back there in the back. And so, knowing that from the perspective of Jacob, Joseph is dead. And Benjamin is the only little piece of Rachel that he has left. And so he holds him back. Genesis 42, 5 and 6, we see these important words. The sons of Israel were among those, all the lands, who came to buy grain, that's means of salvation. For the famine was in the land of Canaan. Joseph was in charge of the country, 
He sold grain to all its people. And listen, his brothers, his brothers came and bowed down before him and their faces hit the ground. And in that moment, we not only see the fulfillment of Joseph's own dream in Genesis 37, but we also see a preview of coming attractions. Because in that moment, they did the most appropriate thing as they stood in the presence of the Savior. They bowed down. And so as we close out morning, I want you to hear this. It's Jesus, not Joseph. Anyone within the sound of my voice, I beg you to listen. Joseph, just like Jesus, is the means of salvation in a time of famine. And Joseph saw the nations come and bow before him. But, like John the Baptist, who said, I must decrease so that Christ might increase. Right now, this morning, Joseph has to decrease. He's not the Messiah. He's not God's one and only son, thoughtless one. But he does illustrate for us something that's coming, that's true. You see, number one, Jesus is God's only means of salvation. We are not universally under a famine, but we are universally under a curse. The curse of sin, which condemns us to eternal death. And we have no hope in this world apart from the fact that God sent his one and only son to pay sin's penalty for us and to die in our place on the cross. Jesus is the only means of salvation. And in the same way that we talked about Pharaoh, if you could FaceTime God the Father right now and ask him, how can I be saved from this judgment that is to come? He's going to say, talk to my son. He is the only way. He is the truth. No one comes before me, the Father, except through Jesus. So Pharaoh said, go see Joseph. God the Father says, go see my son Jesus. He is king. Have you bowed before him? Have you given your life to Jesus, surrendered your life to him? Because here's the second thing. The nations will bow down before Jesus. Jesus is Lord. Whether we come to him for salvation or not, nothing changes the fact that Jesus is Lord. There's those who come to Christ in surrender on bended knee willingly. In other words, we give our life to Jesus. And when we do that, we die that we might live. And then there are those who are unwilling to surrender their lives to Jesus, unwilling to come to him, and they want to go their own way, and they think they are living but in fact, they are dying. And Hebrews 1.3 tells us that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And Philippians 2.10 and 11 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow. For those who know Jesus in this life, you'll find salvation. For those who wait, they will still bow the knee. They will still confess that Christ is Lord. But because they waited, it will be too late. What if Jacob, out of fear, out of envy or out of his own self-confidence, had decided to stay at home? What if he hadn't sent his sons? What if they just stayed where the shelves are empty and the grocery store shelves are empty? I think we know what would have happened. And likewise, if we fail to come to Jesus in the end, we will find that all is left are empty shelves. Nothing. And so I plead with you. Come to Jesus. Come to him today. Bow before the king. you out of the pit of despair, as the psalmist says. And if you know him, you've been brought out. You are victorious in him. Let's proclaim to this world who desperately needs to hear that Jesus still saves. Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you that you still save. Oh, Lord, we cannot even begin to count your blessings in our life. 
Lord, for you brought me, you brought us. Anybody that's in Christ today, you brought us out of the pit of despair, and you have given us a hope that we don't even deserve. Lord, I pray for one who may be within the sound of my voice today, who has been playing a game through life. Maybe they've been in church, maybe not. But there's never been a time when they have given their life to you, Lord. And said, Jesus, I'm yours. I'm surrendering to you. Save me and forgive me. Lord, may today be the day that you are king in their life and that they give their life to you. Lord, have your will and way in this time of invitation. If there's anyone who needs to trust Christ, Lord, may they have the courage to come and just talk with me. I'd love to share with them how they can do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand this morning. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the Sing like a man.
God's people said, amen. Thank you guys for leading us. That was, that was awesome. All right, well, I want to invite you to be seated for just a moment. If you find that you do need to leave, that is fine. We're just going to be just a couple more minutes as we recognize some very special people. And so I'm going to ask my rich friend and Susan, dear Susan, to come on down. Actually, come on up. You guys come on up here with me so our live stream folks can see you. And stare at you for a while. Come on down. Let's make them feel special. Can we do that? Right here. Are you nervous at all, Susan? No, but Rich is crying. Rich? Well, listen, I kind of thought that I kind of thought there may be some tears and there may be some crying. And so to get us started off, to kind of help with that, I want to introduce you to some of your new neighbors, okay? Take a look. You can look there or at the distance, depending on your eye. I see the resemblance, Rich. Piggy, come on, Piggy. Okay, Richard, it's your turn. <laughs> I'm just saying, yeah, I sure do appreciate your cousin sending that in. That was really nice. We want to take just a moment to uh, say how much we love you guys. Susan has been my right hand since day one. I mean, when I think of all of the changes that have occurred at Canyons, she's the constant. And so I'm going to miss her so much, and she's been such a blessing to me. Uh, just in ways that I can't even begin to describe. And Rich is actively serving with our deacons, has been a part of the church. These two are just servants. They do whatever is needed. And uh, some church over there in Arkansas is going to be blessed uh, to have you join. I'm going to invite Ron and Pastor Justin to come up here with us. 
Ron went out and picked some flowers this morning, and they look so beautiful. <laughs> well, Ron, we, we just want to take a moment, and on behalf of the uh, entire church body, but from myself, and from the personnel team, from uh, all of the staff, we just want to say we love you so much, and we're going to miss you. Rich, I'm going to put this one in your hand, and Susan, we're going to let you hold this one for just a moment. Beautiful as you are. If you'll just bring it down just a bit like that. All right. And I, and I have one other gift that I want to give you this morning. Mm. Okay. You know, I said just a moment ago that um, Susan is very, and, and Rich are, are servants. They just are. Um, they'll do whatever needs to be done. And so I can say this as Susan, as my right hand in the office, she constantly is giving of herself. And so I struggled to figure out what could I give her as a personal gift. And so I decided to give her myself. <laughs> and so Susan, I don't know where you might put this in your home, but I'll be looking for it when I come visit. Um, <laughs> If you want to follow my mom and what she used to do with my paint by numbers, you could put it right in the guest bathroom. They wouldn't stay long, would they? <laughs> I'm going to have Justin hold that, if you will. All right, I want to invite you guys to stand, if you will. We're going to gather around, and um, as our closing prayer, we just want to take a moment to pray for the Wilsons. And like we did last week, if you'll just kind of reach out and kind of put your hands up towards them, as we pray over them this morning. Our Heavenly Father, in moments like these, we have a sadness that we're not going to be able to see Rich and Susan as often as we have, but we have a profound gladness, and we are so much better for having known and served with them. Thank you for them. Thank you for your servants. And Lord, we send them out knowing that as they go, that they are part of us. They are part of this body at Canyons Church. And so they're going to go to a new place, but in a lot of ways, it's like they're going out from us to serve you in a new place. And so, Lord, we pray, we commission them to go as your servants, be glorified in their lives, be glorified in the church. Lord, across this land, be glorified in the church that they'll wind up being a part of. Father, thank you for the gifts of rich Thank you for the gifts of Susan. Use them mightily for your glory. Lord, may they know as they go out, not only from the gifts presented here on the platform, but all of the notes and cards and gift cards that are out in the foyer, that this family, this church family, loves them dearly. And so, Lord, in this moment, we do not say goodbye. We simply say we'll see you later. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do this for me if you don't mind. I'm going to have Rich and Susan, you guys can put your gifts on the chairs there. And just stand here. I know folks are going to want to come by and hug your neck. Let me help you there, Susan. And I'm going to race to the back, and we are dismissed. Everybody have a great Lord's Day.